It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this event to mark the launch of the Centre for Science and Philosophy. I know my friends in philosophy are extremely excited by the creation of this centre, but I can attest to the fact that we in science are as well. And science can't do it all on its own, that's really the thought, that science throws up many questions that are ethical, political and social. Questions about judgement and about inference which don't find an answer within scientific theories themselves. Bristol Philosophy Department is one of the top three philosophy of science departments in the whole world. I mean, it really is an excellent philosophy department, and this centre will kind of mark, mark its standing in, in the world. It crystallises something that's been budding in the university for quite a long time, which is interaction between philosophers and scientists. Philosophy of social sciences, philosophy of chemistry, philosophy of psychology, cognitive sciences. It's spreading out and philosophers are engaging much more specifically with all kinds of different parts of science. OK, so what I want to talk to about today is about the role of philosophy of physics in helping form and understand a theory of quantum gravity. Well, it was certainly the biggest audience I've ever spoken to, and I think the biggest audience I've ever seen in philosophy of science, which was uh, really lovely, because I think, as a philosopher, you often sort of work in your ivory tower in a rather isolated way, and we're not always as good at public engagement as we ought to be. If they hear a bell, they've got to tell you the first line. If they hear a whistle, they've got to tell you the second line. If they hear a gong, they've got to tell you the third line. You flash it at them, and then after you finish flashing at them, you give them the gong, or the whistle, or the bell, so hands up, who would say A? OK. Hands up, who would say B? An unpopular choice, it turns out. I think it's an excellent event. It seems very good. I've already spoken to psychologists, biologists, mathematicians, chemists about their work and how it relates to the sort of thing that I'm doing. So it's really exciting. My knowledge of philosophy stopped about 20 years ago. So it's quite good to know that things have progressed and gone in an interesting directions since I stopped doing it. I think that there's a lot of possible cross-fertilisation between all, all of science and philosophy, so I'd like to see more of it happen. It can only have a positive effect, right? I mean, whatever your view on philosophy, even if you think 90% of it is nonsense, there's, there's going to be some good stuff as well. So the more different ways there are of talking to different people about your work, the better. And I think a sign of the vibrancy of the subject is that it filled the Great Hall with six, 700 people. We want to believe what's true, but if we rush ahead, we may end up believing what's false. And how exactly we should decide to balance up avoiding falsity with making sure we believe the truth is, I think, ultimately a philosophical matter.